At that time, Shangi's work was the only work, um, one of the few black creative productions uh, by black people who received, received high acclaim and probably uh, one of the few then and even now that's been produced on Broadway. So I was impressionable then, I still am impressionable with the pop uh, popularity of the play. Because of the popularity of the play, I had thought suicide was an option. <clears throat> now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kinda talk about a little bit about the statistics, spend a lot of few, a little time, or probably more time on theory, and then I'm gonna talk about the lives of the four women that I have here. Uh, according to the Association of Su Suicidology, uh, in 2009, the year for which they had the latest data, there were 36,909 suicides. Uh, making suicide the 11th uh, leading cause of death in the U.S. And although males complete, sui uh, complete suicide at 3.6 times the rate of women, women attempt suicide three times the rate of men. Uh, in 2009, there were 2,084 uh, African Americans who completed suicide, 82% of them were African American male. For the black com uh, community, African American females are four times more likely to attempt suicide. African American males are three times more likely to complete it. Uh, generally, the rate of suicide. This microphone is a little off. The rate of suicide has increased increased dramatically between the 1970s and 1990s, um, and then it kind of leveled off. Uh, I think the the highest rate of suicide is among teens uh, or young adults uh, from youth between the ages of 15 and 24. It's the leading third leading cause of death, uh, and it's increased more than it increased more than 200 percent between the 1950s and the 1970s. However, in, in between the 1970s and 1990s, it kind of leveled off, kind of continued to level off, but now it has declined, decreased again, I mean increased again. Firearms is the most commonly utilized method of suicide, completing suicide for all groups, and although uh, for the most common method of suicide for all females was poisoning, so I'm thinking them taking an overdose of some kind of pills or something. Um, in terms of definitions, contemporary definitions comprise two elements. They talk about the intention and the outcome. And there's been a lot of debate around how we define it because it's often difficult to determine. Uh, for example, there might be the intent to, self, to be self-injurious but rather than a wish to die, it might be a cry, a cry for help. And that's considered parasuicide. Uh, and then there might be the intent to kill oneself but suicide is not completed. Um, and so suicide ideologists generally kind of define the terms as fatal and non-fatal. Uh, and so when they talked about a fatal, they said a death, a death and it's being defined as a death resulting from a self-inflicted injury in which the individual tended to kill him or herself and completes it. And then non-fatal suicide is a potential self-inflicted injury in which the individual intended to kill him or herself but did not result in death, and so that's considered attempted suicide. Now, suicide has been widely studied. There have been neuro neuro neurobiological, sociological, psychological, and uh, cultural theories that have been proposed to explain why people would opt to end their own lives. Um, neurobiological factors focus on the adequacy and supply of trans, uh, neurotransmitters. So a lot of people don't have enough of things like dopamine, uh, what is the other one, serotonin, things like that. And so they have difficulty, um, in, which leads to depression. Uh, one of the earliest, most comprehensive studies that's ever been done on suicide was that by, by, uh, by uh, uh, Durkin, Durkin, Durkheim, Emily Durkheim, uh, in a study called Suicide, which was first published in 1897. And basically what he did was kind of discard the, the uh, previous ideals about why people commit suicide. People thought that people commit suicide because of climate, psychopathology, all those kind of things. And he, his study was on Catholic and um, Protestant countries and he found that suicide was highest among Protestant countries and he thought it had a lot to do with people's social relationships, how they were connected socially. Um, so he, he has two, uh, several types uh, that he could, four types of suicide. One of them they call egoistic, altruistic, anomaly, and fatalistic. And these types he concluded had to do with how people are integrated into, and regulated by society. Uh, egoistic suicide stems from a deficient integration of the individual in society and family life, which I think has some implications for black women or black people, and particularly black women. And then while Altruistic suicide stems from excessive integration to society. And that's what we mean by suicide bombers and people who commit suicide for religious reasons. Anami uh, suicide refers to deficient regulation over relationships between the individual and society is disrupted for, or shattered. For example, the shocking loss of a job, a family member, finances, and things like that. And then fatalistic suicide is derived from overregulation in the society where individual needs are blocked by oppressive forces. For example, for, like African Americans. And so in terms of under, trying to understand and explain the suicide, a lot of people apply the fatalistic suicide for black Americans. 
There's been other psychological theories, um, and some of them I'm just gonna go through very quickly. One of them is called escape theory, and, it's high, and they hypothesize um, that suicide is an attempt to escape from intense or unbearable psychological pain, stemming from a discrepancy between identified goals and perceived failures in a deficient scale set that allows for adequate, adequate problem solving and regulation of the associated effect. Scheidman, uh, who I really like, uh, he proposed that uh, an overwhelming and unmanageable psychological and emotional pain leads to what he calls a psych ache. And I'm gonna come back to that through this. Um, then you have Beck's hopelessness theory, and he proposed the presence of suicide schemes or schemas, which, he, uh, uh, which, which are beliefs related to hopelessness resulting from maladaptive information over positive information that could lead to a, a sense of hope. And then we have another theory called the cry of pain model of suicide that uh, where they emphasize the over general, that emphasizes the over general memory where an impaired or deficiency in the autobiographical memory makes it difficult to recall reasons for living uh, and, and assessing other cognitive materials that facilitates both hope and problem solving. And then we have the cultural factors. Um, Posant, uh, Alexander did a, a book that really studies this uh, more extensively. But culturally, historically, people didn't think that black people suffered from, uh, were too ignorant to suffer from depression, let alone commit suicide. This is how a lot of the people theor uh, historically uh, uh, thought about suicide for black people. And they said that one of the reasons they didn't think we were, they thought we were too ignorant to uh, co uh, commit suicide or that one of the reasons that wasn't something that was prevalent among black people was because they said that we were more allowed to be more emotionally expressive and that we have more social supports. Um, and because African Americans have the lowest suicide rates of all groups, it might not be taken that seriously, and black women have the even lower suicide rates. So, uh, so because we're, our suicide rates are lower, then a lot of times it's not taken seriously in our group as it is other groups. Uh, but one of the things that Pouzant pointed out and other studies have pointed out that lower suicide rates might be the result of suicide deaths being uh, uh, misdiagnosed or misclassified. Uh, they said, for example, uh, suicide by cop or victim precipitated suicide, which is a situation in which a destroyed individual arms him or herself and intentionally goes to lower enfor uh, lower, lower law enforcement officials into shooting them. There's also been very little research that examines age class, race, um, I mean, age, class, gender differences, and even sexual orientation. Uh, one of the things I, I there's an association of uh, suicidology, and they say that suicide is increasing dramatically amongst uh, people who are of uh, the gay and lesbian community. And there's research that also doesn't look at within group differences. There's a debate as to whether or not culturally uh, specific factors can buffer African American from, uh, uh, from suicide. There's methodological flaws in the research where comparisons are made between attempters and completers. And there's limited research that uses longitudinal and then psychological autopsy methods, which I think would be better methods if somebody's gonna uh, look at this among uh, black women. Now, research on African Americans generally focus on risk factors. And some of the risk factors, just a number of factors, some of them include, um, uh, particularly a lot of it looked at uh, the research on low-income African American, low-income African American women, and some of the uh, risk factors meet or include deficits in family function and social supports, minority stress, cultural belief that suicide is a white thing, uh, various attempt, uh, previous attempts, uh, people who have previous attempts who are more at risk of completing, um, suicide acceptability, aggression, hopelessness, so just a number of things. Um, uh, also, low religiosity, uh, low religiosity in church attendance, family violence, occupational income, and racial inequality, like I said, a number of things. And then uh, psychological issues like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and maladaptive coping. Um, included to, in, um, in these risk factors for black women, they're saying it's all, uh, high for black women are uh, interpartner violence and abusive relationships. Now, I think that uh, Durkheim's theory and Snyder's theory, Psych 8, to me, I think are theories that could be applied when we look, kind of looking at it from the perspective of how it affects black people and particularly how it affects black women. Uh, being an outgroup with, uh, uh, with a history steeped in racial oppression and social issues associated with poverty, the question to me is, is the type of pain experience important for us to examine and important for us to look at? Do African Americans experience different kinds of pains that, are, that is worth noting to help explain suicide? And more specifically, given the social cultural factor of the shortage of men, making it difficult for African American women to find partners, and the fact that many of them are partnered with men who experience a number of social issues themselves, stemming from racial oppression, like sub, under, and 
uh, and sub un and unemployed men, stereotypes and racial profiling, masculine, a uh, masculine value system to make up for the continuous assaults of their manhood, substance abuse, a history of incarceration. Women are uh, in partner with men who have these kind of issues. Uh, the question is, is this specific psycho, social, cultural factor that, uh, deserve, that does this, this year deserve some attention in understanding suicide among African American women? And then another question is, might the source of pain, the fact that there are many sources of pain, and the fact that there might be somewhat about what I would call like a stacking or compounded pain, meaning um, people experience pain and because they don't adequately address it, they now become stacked up. Okay, uh, and, and, and they might we look at an African-centered approach to understanding pain and grief, because I think for, for many African-Americans, uh, many of us suffer from grief, and the question to me is, might the uh, implication, might this have some implication for, for prevention and intervention for suicide among African-Americans and, and for African-American women in particular? Now, I attended a workshop recently by Sobonfo Somme, and I don't know if you're familiar with her, with her work. Uh, anybody familiar, are we familiar with Sobonfo? So May, is anybody for me? Okay, well, this is really y'all, please, I mean, look, look into uh, reading her work. I use her book, Spirit of Intimacy, for my class. Um, she just wrote another book called um, Out of Grace, and her husband also does work uh, on uh, how dealing with mental health and some levels in terms of how black people deal with loss, but they approach uh, health from, a, from an African-centered perspective. So she says some things, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but, um, some of the things that stood out to me is, again, when, I talk about, when we talk about pain and we talk about grief, um, I think that understanding that might be kind of useful for us. So, for example, I would say that many uh, black people might be suffering from what uh, Sidon calls a psych ache. He's, uh, he talks about many of our black people are suffering from personal pain that's stemming from traumas that they experience in society at large and in their families and communities from those who, they, who are hurting themselves. Um, they experience psycho, uh, social, cultural, psychological pain being a bicultural group where they might have, diff have difficulty reconciling the strain of being a bicultural group and Bobby Wright referred to this as menticide. Uh, they also experience pain from mundane extreme environment and stress with the stress as ubiquitous and continuing in addition to normal life stressors. stressors. In addition, they might experience pain stemming from disenfranchised grief. Uh, and this is uh, stemming from loss of personhood, self and dignity, and freedom as they serve capitalistic superstructures by going to meaningless jobs and for some only coming home to loneliness, loss of health, loss of employment, and most importantly, loss of those uh, whom they love through separate relationships, incarceration, or death. But I think some suffer from more than pain from their own personal pain and personal grief, and this is what some, uh, Sabonfe got into. She talked about different kinds of grief. One of them she called ancestral grief, which I thought was interesting, and this is the inherited psychic memories of the crimes against our ancestors. And then for some of us who might experience that, on top of some of us who are in black studies and we read this, this stuff, and now you're compounding the, the inherited grief with the stuff that we're studying, so, and, which can cause people to suffer from pain. There's another term that I found, a type of grief that I found was called anticipatory grief. And this is the anticipation of losing a child, um, a partner or a family member to incarceration, or a premature death through violence and substance abuse and things like that. And the example we have now is the Trayvon case. And, and I think that's really big for black women. I know it's big for me. I don't even have children. Um, but when I, I did take in uh, a couple of children from my sister, uh, my niece and nephew, and I just can't tell you how overwhelming it was every day that boy walked out of the house. That, because he, didn't, you know, he didn't, wasn't making good choices and he wasn't, didn't think. And I was so worried about that boy getting killed. And you know, interestingly, uh, in, in our communities, you know, when we talk about gender differences in terms of how we raise our boys and our girls, you know, I teach this stuff in my classes, but it was amazing to me how when I got the, a boy and a girl, how different I was dealing with both of them. But I really actually thought his, and for her, I'm just on top of her trying to hide her, keep her, you know, worried that, you know, she's going to get pregnant, just trying to keep her from getting pregnant. For him, I was worried about him getting killed. And, um, I had a thought here. Um, he, um, Right, and so I begin to, you know, deal with him in another way because I'm like, every time he walks out into the street, I'm worried about somebody taking his life. So it's almost like I was more worried about him in the streets than I was worried about her. And so our boys are more at risk, if not, if, uh, are at risk, but not more at risk than our girls. Um, so a lot of us suffer from that. And then even, not, not even just our children, but even our partners. When my husband's out late, I'm wor I worry about whether or not he's going to make it home. 
Okay, whether not, you know, he's out, you know, because there's somebody's gonna stop him and shoot him, you know, those kinds of things. So, so you worry about them being killed by other black men or particularly, potentially by the police department. Uh, Somme uh, Som talked about uh, earth grief, and these are pine, cr cr pain of crimes against the earth, which African descendant people were deeply spiritually attached to. Um, and then she talked about global grief, um, the pain of the world, traumas, natural disasters, crimes against humanity. And I think that this really is something to take into consideration because we're exposed to it through uh, repeating overexposure to the mass media. And then other people's grief. And, you know, and I, I look at all this because I remember when I went to that presentation, you, know, you wonder why you're experiencing pain when you don't even have anything going on in your life that's personal. And, it's, and I, when she brought up these things, I was like, oh, okay, I get it, okay? So, because one of the things that I find very, very difficult is turning it to the local, I don't, you know, I got into the place where I don't even watch the local news. Because it's almost at least once a week you're gonna hear somebody's child got killed. And so when you talk about the pain of watching black mothers and fathers and families lose their children and other family members to crime and violence in African-American communities to over and repeat exposure to the mass media. So to, for me, the Trayvon case, I'm thinking it was you know, great that that took, went to the level that it went to, uh, to but you know, who's crying for all the black men uh, that are being, uh, black boys that are being killed every single day across America? And the pain that a lot of our uh, mothers and fathers and families are experiencing because of that. Okay. So um, these types of grief can lead to a complicated or complex grief, which is defined as prolonged, disturbed, or extreme, or compounded grief. And, uh, and I'm calling compounded grief that, which I just said, is that it's stacking up of multiple losses, uh, and also the multiple pain that people begin to suffer from. Uh, and then, as I said, because the pain is not being addressed as it comes, and people, it begins to stack up, and then it, can, it becomes to a place where the, the weight of it becomes too much to bear. So for, for African-American women, the pain of not having a partner also might be taken into consideration because it's not, uh, Durkheim talked about not being connected to social, having uh, social connections uh, and belonging and things like that. But there's two kinds of uh, loneliness that people experience. One is social loneliness and one is emotional loneliness. And so for African-American women, I look at what I would call a psychic or a soul pain that stems from the loneliness due to lack of support from a soul partner. Um, and that to me is different than, again, so, again social pain. Um, and then in some of the studies they found that a prime precipitant for non-fatal suicide behavior in African-American women is with desperation or being abandoned by a lover. So the question is, how, the, how is it that women of, this, of the high social economic status of Nita McLean and Phyllis Hyman committed suicide? And then what type of pain or grief did they experience? So the question is, what can we learn from their lives about the culture and gender-specific factors uh, that might serve to provide cultural and gender specific prevention and intervention. Um, uh, it was while well, I was living in DC that I was exposed to the, how many of us heard of Lenita McLean? Anybody heard of Lenita McLean? Okay. Uh, it was what I was I had read her story in the 80s, um, uh, and it was a tragic story of that was talked of, that was uh, done in an essay to be gifted black and alone written by B.B. Moore Campbell, and uh, what she kind of. Uh, talks to is that although Lenita grew up in the housing products of the south side of Chicago, by the time she was 32, she had made some astonishing achievements. As a journalist, she was the first African-American woman to be a member of the Chicago's Tribune editorial board in the newspaper 137-year history. She won a National Journalistic Award, received top honors for, from the um, Association of Black Journalists for Commentary, won the Kitty Award for Outstanding Black Women, role models, and was selected by Glamour Magazine as one of the most outstanding working women in America. There's a book of essays called A Foot in Two Worlds that was edited by her, her ex-husband, uh, Clarence Page. And this was not only revealing uh, of the struggles of a leader, but her sheer honesty about American hypocrisy and white racism of a movie. Um, in an essay she in, called Middle Class, uh, The Middle Class Blacks Burdens, published in Newsweek, one finds that Lenita, Lenita was played with her guilt about her success while too many African Americans languished in despair and she stated, I'm not comfortably middle class, I'm uncomfortably middle class. Her marginalization in both the black and uh, uh, white worlds also plagued her. She states, I'm a gauntlet between two worlds and I'm cursed and blessed by both. I have a foot in each world but I cannot fool myself either. I see the transparent deception of some whites and the bitter hopelessness of some blacks. I know how tenuous my grip on the way of life is and how strangling the grip on the other way of life can be. She further states, white won't believe I remain culturally different. Blacks won't believe I remain culturally the same. And she pointed out uh, that she was also pained at the coming face to face with her tokenism working in, uh, uh, as a journalist. She says here, 
I am painfully aware that even my white off trappings, I am prejudiced by my color. Some of my liberal white acquaintances pat me on the head while hinting that I'm a freak, that my success is less a matter of talent than of luck and affirmative action. I may live among them, but it's difficult to live with them. How can they be sincere about respecting me yet hold my fellows in contempt? And if I am silent when they attempt to sever me from my own, how can I live with myself? Her rage and anger and pain over racism that emerged around the Chicago mayoral election of Harold Washington, the hypocrisy and racism of her white colleagues and who she thought were her friends increased as revealed in this essay, How Chicago Taught Me to Hate Whites. She laments, where is there then to be, uh, where, what is it there then to believe in? Who was I to trust? How do I know which whites are good and which were bad? How many of my coworkers wouldn't even want me next door? All of these years of lunch dates and the familiar togetherness uh, that comes naturally from working to get, uh, next to someone 40 hours a week, how could I know who was on the level? If I was feeling this way, what were my sisters and brothers in the streets feeling? Uh, what litmus test could I advise? I did distance myself from everyone white, watching and listening of, for hints of latent prejudice, but they were no formless to follow. Bitter am I, that is mild. The blatant racism from the uh, letters mailed to Ch the Chicago Tribune because it endorsed Harold Washington were uh, filled with letters like lies, nigger lovers, black baboons, uh, and to the words they kept saying, the blacks, the needed states that would make me feel like machine gunning every white face on the bus. And she actually got this published in the Chicago Tribune. So, and I'm thinking uh, after this was published, I thought thinking after this was published, I'm sure that it, it, it was a lot of backlash and I'm thinking that may have contributed to her demise. But according to Campbell, out of all that she experienced, experienced loneliness was her most difficult challenge. She did not have a personal relationship. Like many women, uh, she experienced a great deal of stress only to come home to loneliness, and she began to crack under the emotional load. On the night that would have been her 10th wedding anniversary, she followed a huge overdose of amitriptyline and left both worlds behind. To escape her rage, her marginalization, her loneliness, in the words of Lanita, she finally laid down her burden and escaped the narrow alley located between pain and desire to another place. Her, un her unanswered questions continued to haunt her sisters. I made it, but where? When Phyllis committed suicide, I was living in Atlanta, uh, and I was you know, just dumbfounded by it because I really had been a follower. I loved her music, and I had been a follower of her. Uh, uh, Hyman's astonishing achievement included 10 albums, a Broadway, a role, and the Broadway production of Sophisticated Ladies and a Tony Award nomination in 1981 for the role. I've just kind of started reading her biography. Somebody wrote a biography uh, called The Strength of a Woman. And one of the things I discovered, some of the things I discovered was her early beginning. She, her mother was uh, deeply depressed and her father was alcoholic and they were raised in uh, extreme poverty. Um, but I connected to Phyllis because I heard the loneliness in her songs just like I heard the Billie uh, Holiday's loneliness and her pain in her songs. And I thought it was interesting how we were playing Billie Holiday today. <laughs> and I play her, used to play her quite often. Um, so I was kind of pained by her suicide and kind of wanted to know what happened. And so I began to look for answers. I actually kind of did a quote from her uh, in my book on uh, uh, we want for ourselves what we want for ourselves. But uh, she had a, a manager who was a friend and uh, her manager said that Hyman suffered from not only from personal pain but from global pain which I thought was interesting. And she said that she was gifted not only with a voice, but a psychic ability. She was able to see things before happening. And she loved very, very deep. She loved in a very, very deep way. So she had the capacity to love and be, be very, become very empathic, meaning that she was so sensitive to other people that she could actually feel the pain of other people. She also could feel the pain of the world. For example, the Oklahoma bomb, and they said, she said that she would actually have to go in and withdraw for days to recover from some of the things that would go on uh, in the world. Uh, she also had been diagnosed with bipolar and she suffered from a number of other risk factors, including depression, obesity, alcoholism. Um, and it said that she was also consuming, had started consuming a lot of anger because people who had less talent and less great you know, voices were uh, having more success. But uh, for according to Garcia, her most basic, the, the thing that contributed most to her pain was her most basic need, and that was to love and receive love. That she just wasn't had difficulty having a, a personal relationship. Um, and I, I, she was at high risk because, according to Garcia, she had also t attempted suicide. She had attempted suicide twice, so that put her at high risk. And uh, Jet Magazine did an interview, I think, with her ex-partner. Um, but they said that the night that she committed suicide, she had a long conversation with him, and he tried to talk her out of it. 
Uh, she t told him that if you try to talk bad, I'm going to hang up on you. I think he, he did. He talked and she, she hung up. They called each other back. Um, according to him, she said she was just existing. And she went through 47 years. The way, 47 years that she already experienced, she didn't want to experience another 47 years like that. She said that, uh, she says, uh, I'm unhappy. The only bright light in my life, uh, is to, the only bright light is to die. So I won't have to worry about a job or other people. And I thought that was interesting because you never think somebody of her status would be, would be worried about a job. Um, she said, I have no personal life, no energy, and all I want to do is go. And then when he told her other people would miss her, she said, well, you know, I'm not going to stay around for people to miss me. I never see them anyway. They'll get over it. Uh, and she said, she had, again, she had previously attempted, she said that she'd know how to do it now. So that I thought was interesting. And I'm thinking that's why the, the attempters for women is not as, uh, they don't complete it because they don't know how to do it. They take pills and they end up waking up. Uh, but unfortunately, I thought it was uh, that in her last uh, CD, she, on uh, I Refuse to Be Lonely album, she also had a song up there called This Too Shall Pass. And interestingly for me, I used that song. I had a, a friend of a, a, uh, my uh, cousin, daughter got murdered uh, in her house, and she came home one day after work and the daughter was murdered, which is still unresolved. Nobody knows what happened. It was so gruesome, you know, the, the idea of walking home and finding your daughter rolled up in a carpet, they had stabbed her, rolled her up in a carpet, put a bag over her head. Uh, and I'm interviewing her now on my grief research. But I used that song to get through that moment because that was so traumatized. I'm still traumatized by it. Um, and so she, did, so the song, you know, she goes, sings over and over and over, this too shall pass. But I thought it was kind of ironic that she talks, she sings that song, but she wasn't able to get through that difficult moment and she ended up killing herself. Uh, so, uh, so as the previous researchers have, uh, Oh, and so when the research that looks at protective factors for African American women, uh, these are some of the protective factors uh, they consider uh, to help women are reasons for living, hope, self efficacy, coping skills, positive family relationships, uh, social support, and ability to obtain uh, material resources. But the most significant one is spirituality. Um, they, they found that to be the most significant um, uh, protective factor for, uh, for black women. And one, and for older black women, they say they have the lowest suicide rates, and I suspect that a lot of that had to do with spirituality, because they've learned how to navigate the challenges of life, and they're deeply spiritual. Um, now, as I said earlier, there's like a lot of limitations in terms of the research, um, uh, but I think that in order to effectively address suicide among African Americans in general, and African American women in particular, it's important to address the causes of the painful state because a lot of the research looks at the, 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 a lot of the quantitative research, and they don't really look at what's really, really going on. And, and I think that it really would include really doing more long interviews and really getting at what's really going on. Because until you address that, then you're not going. I don't think you're going to be able to effectively address what's going on. Uh, some people have proposed a psychological autopsy, which was the first time I heard that. Have you ever heard of a psychological autopsy? But that's really people who have completed it. You kind of go back and look at what was going on, which is what I'm attempting to do here with some of this stuff. Um, and I think for African American women, you really have to look at the loneliness that some of them experience because of not having a partner, uh, and instances where they don't have a partner, then we have to figure out how to help them be able to focus in on getting other kinds of community support. I'm doing um, this but it's really, again, we have to figure out how to approach this. And African uh, centered approaches, I, I think, also uh, needed and and Af the African centered approach does not look at the mental and the physical causes, but it also looks at the spiritual causes. Because they do believe that there could be other worldly things that's going on that's causing pain. For example, an ancestor that's trying to resolve something through their descendants. Um, and so, what might also be considered is race, culture, and gender specific empowerment therapy. Uh, and I don't, I don't really know uh, if anybody's doing that right now, but I'm just thinking that's something that I'm, I'm looking into therapy and different kinds of treatment. and. Uh, from my own personal experiences, uh, I, I, it has been really the black voices of black women that has really helped me uh, to get through life. Uh, through their songs, their written words, their work has inspired me in some of my most difficult moments. For example, Phyllis Hyman's This Too Shall Pass, Billie Holiday, I think she says something like, you know, I might not be the cutest person in the world, but you know, I, my mama gave me something I can take all over the world. Um, I like Nina Simone, she's like, you know, my name is Peaches and I kill, for the, kill the first mother I see. You know, so those kind of things kind of <laughs> empower you. Uh, Mariah's uh, carry song, you know, the hero inside of you, helped me get through a very, very challenging moment. And also the voice of black women, I'm sure for a lot of the younger black women, there's Jill Scott and um, Mary J. Uh, uh, Blige and, and those voices. And it's also the voice of black women 
uh, that have empowered me, like Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins, Paula Gidding, Darnie Clark Hines, who have written about the work and the lives of black women. Uh, I have been moved by the voices of protest against injustice, how Harriet Tubman, Soldier the Truth, Ida B. Wells, and the numerous women of the 19th century uh, club women's movement, the women I grew up with, the women in our churches and our communities, how they actually took their pain uh, and turned it into a passion, uh, turned it into a purpose filled with passion to change not only their life, but their life experiences and those around them. And I've also found useful in my own life of how these women have been deeply spiritual. Even I, I think Harriet Tubman's story was probably one of the most profound stories that I've read in terms of how spirituality is what guided her and what got her through even escaping herself in, in those moments when she was coming back, listening to the voice and things like that. Um, and how they were able to sustain some of, most, some of the most tenuous circumstances and how they were able to pull some of the most tremendous feats. So I'd like to end this by saying this is for Lanita and Phyllis and all the unnamed colored girls who have committed suicide. And some of it has to do with the Trayvon thing. Like I said, some of us really take this stuff in. Uh, for colored girls who have considered suicide, where the rainbow is enough, for colored girls who have made it through the storm, you too can turn your pain into purpose through a passion to make a difference. And in the words of Nintazaki Shenji, you must find first find God in yourself and love her fiercely. I'm done. <laughs>